Good morning. morning. Wonderful. Just as Bruce was saying, um, we we have such talent in this in this fellowship in this congregation. I'm always amazed. I, I I talk I talk about it more often than you think. That this little fellowship has such talent, such wonderful people, such good speakers and warm hearts and loving nature. And now Susan chooses our inspirational readings on the, usually every month we have an NDE speaker, near death experience. And we've been having this speaker for years and years and years. This congregation, this fellowship is by far the most educated, the most enlightened group of people on near-death experiences as a group of any, of any group in the world. Absolutely. There's no group this size that every month hears a speaker on near-death experiences and knows what a profound experience, spiritual experience it is. And so we bring that here. And in Susan's um, quotes today, you start off with Dr. Atwater, PMH Atwater, who will be our speaker today. And then, unfortunately, Edgar Casey and Robert Monroe are no longer with us. But we remember Dr. Eben Alexander. He's spoken here twice. Had a best-selling book on the New York booksellers for 64 weeks, more than a year. He's spoken here twice on near-death experiences. So we really know about it, but we never, I never get enough of it. I'm always, I'm always so pleased to hear another outstanding speaker. And, and PMH Atwater uh, is one of the pioneers. If we understand that Raymond Moody coined the term near-death experience in 1975, PMH and Kenneth Ring and a few others already were writing in, this, in the later 70s, I mean, just a few years after that, and, sh- and, a f- and they were already starting their research. So within a few years after Moody's book, PMH was writing about near-death experiences. She is the most profound author of books on the subject of near-death experiences. She has 16 books published and uh, another six or seven books on non-NDAE experiences. So we're really, she's a renowned, world-renowned expert on the subject and a pioneer, um, a Western gal, Idaho. And so she sort of speaks sort of straight stuff. She's spunky. (laughs) You know, she is a spunky lady from Idaho. I think you're going to like her. Dr. P.M.A. Chatwater. Dick, you and Bonnie, my heart goes out to you. We're with you. It's especially meaningful for me to see you today. I'm telling stories. First story, April last year. This book came out. A Manual for Developing Humans. There's no other manual like it anywhere, so don't compare it. It's fifth dimensional, conscious, subconscious, superconscious, all handled at the same time. So we're talking fifth dimension, all is revealed, intention rules. All is revealed, intention rules. All is revealed, intention rules in this book. It's filled with thought forms. There's 28 of them. I was told to do this book in my third near-death experience. I was also told to do future memory, which is on the the back table. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) one of them's holding up the book already. Future memory. It is a labyrinth. It is not a book. It is designed to help you Uh, rise in consciousness to the next highest level possible for you. Every sentence, every paragraph, every page is part of the math 
I use to create the labyrinth. It is a real labyrinth. April, I'm holding this book just out. Took 40 years to do it. Within 10 minutes, all of the energy I was given to do my work, to complete my mission, by what is called, what I call the voice like none other, left. I felt it leave, I heard it leave, and I smelled it leave. Yes, it had an odor. And my ability to sing went with it. Gone. For several weeks, I was absolutely lost. I felt naked. I was nothing. It was all over. All of these people that tell you you always have a choice, you're always at choice. I was never at choice with my mission, ever. Suddenly, the mission is fulfilled, my work is done, the energy is gone. And after a couple of weeks of that, I thought, well, maybe I can make a choice. So I decided to make a choice. <laughs> I chose to write four more books. <laughs> Four more books, and I'm on the first one now. Um, I'm on chapter six. It's a major study of child experiencers from birth until the age of five of womb memories. It's a major study. And it's so exciting to be doing it. And then in October last year, mid-October, A most incredible thing happened. I was on a tall ladder in the backyard trimming our crepe myrtle tree. I was all done except for two more mm, parts of the tree. And I was up almost at the top of the ladder, me and my, you know, big shears. And I had this feeling, no, don't reach for those. Get back down off the ladder. So I started to get back down off the ladder. And suddenly, I am flying in air. I am air bomb, uh, air bomb <coughs> whatever. I'm flying in the air. And I land at the only place I could have landed without breaking my neck or killing myself. I landed on soft, moist earth lawn. Had I been to the left, I would have landed on hard metal, a lot of it. Had I landed to the right, hard wood. I landed in the only place I could land. I know how to fall, so I was turning, I was rolling. I lit on the left shoulder, the left arm. The head did not go down. I'm just sort of, that went down, the rest of me didn't. And suddenly, I lost total control of myself. And I'm gasping for air, and I'm gasping, and I'm gasping, and I couldn't control anything. My lungs were not working. My nose was not working. Yet there was globs of air coming in and filling my body. Lungs not working, nose not working, air coming in and filling the body. And I came up out of that and I recognized the feeling. That feeling. Not breathing. Yet able to think, able to 
operate. When it finally let go of me, whatever it was, I recognized the feeling of in that space and being out of that space, being a near-death researcher since 1978, one of the after effects nobody's writing about, but I will, is you stop breathing every once in a while. Maybe for five minutes, maybe a couple of minutes, maybe ten minutes, and you're moving, you're doing your work, you're thinking. You don't miss it at all. Not at all. And it's the same feeling I had when I landed on the earth. And what I'm going through with my 120 cases now that I've gone through before, but I'm now focusing on it, is ever so many of these children drowned, but ever so many of these children could breathe underwater. And I remembered my, my son. Often he'd go into the swimming pools and he'd just walk down the swimming pool, bottom of the swimming pool. He had a wonderful time. Of course, mom and dad were panicking. What's this kid doing? But, but it, I mean, no need for air. He could breathe in water. So many children can breathe in water. But the lungs are not working. The nose is not working. So many adults, after a near-death experience, maybe other kinds of adults everywhere, go through life with periods of not breathing and they don't need the air. How many times have you in your spiritual studies heard about these people, they're called the enlightened ones, who don't need air. Live their life. No air. Folks, The vagal nerve, if you know anything at all about the vagal nerve or vagus nerve, you can call it the vagus or vagal, it is that survival nerve in your body that connects all of your vital organs. Its job is to make sure you survive. If you're in a point of um, where, you, where you really need special help, the vagal nerve takes over. It connects every, all the vital organs. It is a strong, long nerve. The job of the vagal nerve is to bring in the blood from all of the extremities and pack it around the heart. Its job is to protect your heart. Its job is to make sure there's oxygen flooding the brain so you don't lose the brain, your ability to think. So it packs the heart with blood and it breathes for you to make sure that the brain is filled with oxygen. So it protects the brain, it protects the heart. It keeps you going. It was the vagal nerve when I fell that took over. I'm 
mean it took over. There was nothing I could do to change anything. The vagal nerve was in charge. Now be with me for a minute. In the study of near death, adults and children, very seldom do you ever hear of anyone who sees or talks about the silver, the silver cord. You don't hear it. Once in a while, maybe. But you don't hear about it. And it isn't it interesting that no matter how we're carved up, cut up, or killed, we come back. Isn't that interesting? I know you know of startling cases. Evan Alexander's is one of them. Who against all odds came back. There was no way he could come back. He came back. Yet hardly anybody ever sees a silver cord. And a lot of psychics and enlightened people say, well, you know, the silver cord didn't break. That's why they came back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me suggest to you that the vagal nerve is the physical component of the silver cord. Your vagal nerve is the physical component of the silver cord. Its job is to pack the heart with blood and flood the brain with air. And it will do its job. until it's time to let go. Why do we come back from horrific accidents and illness? Because the vagal cord has not yet let go. Isn't that interesting? That no matter what we do in life, no matter what we think, no matter what we feel, no matter what you believe, this life is spiritual. This life is an expression of spirit. This life is God's life. This is God's life. We are all gods in the making. All of us. It's literal. And somehow, some way, we're going to fulfill God's life. When it is our time, we'll let go. But we're going to fulfill that life. I don't care how damaged you are. That vagal nerve is going to hold you until the spirit within you, until the soul within you pulls it back. I consider that fall I took in mid-October the luckiest, most wonderful thing that could have happened to me because it tied up so many loose threads in my research. And it enabled me to really feel and know that the soul is in charge, the soul is powerful. And I'm going to complete my mission on earth. 
no matter what happens. And when it's done, I'll leave, but not before. The heart is your love organ. Your emotions, your feeling, your sense of being. The vagal nerve is the connector. It makes sure nothing gets lost. Isn't that wonderful? We have a connector. Every bit as important as the heart. Maybe more important. The silver cord is our vagal nerve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If we have more time, maybe you can answer some questions. Well, Here hey, that, that big fall when I was airborne? You know, that wasn't too bad for, for a woman who's 80 years old. <laughs> Not bad. When you described your near-death experiences of 1977, you said after that last one, there were periods of time in which you were not breathing. Right. Right. And I saw it again and again and again in thousands of people. Folks, these legends and stories we hear about the enlightened ones or the various emissaries that walk the earth with us that don't breathe. I think it's true. Yes? Um, I'm wondering, when people are having uh, their near-death experiences and they, they've left their body, is this vagal nerve in play, do you think, at that point? Oh, I absolutely. Uh, the, the question was with, uh, when people die, uh, near death experiences when they die, is the vagal nerve uh, still working? Is that what brings us back? Absolutely. You're not going to stop that vagal nerve. I can't begin to tell you how powerful the vagal nerve is. You cannot move, you cannot think. You cannot talk. You cannot do anything when the vagal nerve is in charge. It runs you. I mean, the power of the vagal nerve, just wow. We think we're powerful. That nerve is, I was going to call it steel, but it's more powerful than steel. It's going to keep you where you are, whether you want to be there or not. Whether you're trying suicide or not, it's going to keep you where you are. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Mine's more common. My niece is a nurse, and she has MS. And she did a lot of research and decided to have surgery on her vagus nerve. Oh, and she did. 90% better. It's shocking. She had surgery. This is a, a, a nurse uh, that had surgery on her vagal nerve, and she's now like 90% better. Oh, yeah. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. So apparently the vagal nerve needed a little help. Apparently. <laughs> but once you get it working, it's working. Anybody else? Any more questions? Yes? Well, I'm interested in what you said about the, your experience of this energy that you had all of your life, well, you were aware of while you were doing your mission, at least you were aware of it sometime, and then it leaving. It and, left. And then I'm wondering, you, it sounds like you're, if you're not on your, your old mission, that you're on a new mission. And Could be. Well, you're still here. <laughs> Obviously. And then, so I'm wondering, <laughs> what your experience is of your new energy or your... Okay, the old energy was I was like a atomic... I was like atomic 
energy reactor. No one and nothing could stop me from doing what I did, period. I worked an average of about a 12-hour day, six and a half days a week. Very seldom took any time off ever for about 25 years. Let's say I was obsessed. And then I felt a little sorry for myself and I decided, well, this is a pretty heavy workload. I'll reduce it to eight hours a day, maybe five days a week. So that's about what I work now. Um, so my former energy was like a like a blast of atomic energy. It's like Hiroshima. And I worked with that every day. Solid. Um, please know, that for those of you who are, are astrologers, um, I have Pluto just a few degrees um, into the first house on the rising sign. So am I a Plutonian? I was born that way. Um, but now, now, I think my husband can attest to this. I just have more fun. <laughs> um, I just decided I'm not going to be an ordinary researcher anymore. I'm just going to do my own thing. And if the guys and the gals in their scientific protocols don't like it, tough. You know, it's like up yours. Um, I'm a cop's kid. I was raised in a police station. I do very good work. I am very thorough. There is no scientific protocol you can name that is thorough as the work I do. Um, in the scientific protocol, you have advanced words. They use words in advance. A good cop never uses words in advance. Let's say there's an accident, there's four witnesses, a cop will go up and say, uh, did you see anything? If the individual says, yes, I saw a car hit another car, then and then only can a good cop use the word car. You see, my, the way I work is, um, it, it's all open-ended. You know, did you experience anything? Did you see anything? Did anything happen? Tell me about it. The magical word in my business is, tell me more. And? And? You know, describe that for me. And? Um, this is the way I work. And I work with significant others as well as the experiencer. Um, I want to know what it's like for them. What did they see? What did they smell? What did they pick up about the experiencer? So I, I want to know from the, um, the significant others, um, the neighbors, the, the employer, the health care givers, mom and dad, kids, you know, what it was like for them. Um, did they see anything? So that's what I mean by thorough. Year after year after year, day after day after day, decade after decade. I'm still doing it. In my research base that I, that I have now, it's the most varied, it's the broadest research base I've ever had. 
And it's so exciting to me. I mean, I've got, I, I've got the Canadian elders. I've got Aborigines. I've got people from all over the world, all races. I've got three people raised in Vunu. I've got two cases where the child was birthed only so the parents could use them in satanic rituals. I've got all kinds of cases. And it's just fabulous for me. Of course, I'm crying through a lot of them. But it's fabulous for me to see how does this work in these kinds of different cases. And what I'm finding is that no matter who you are, where you are, what you believe, the pattern is the same. Even with this woman who had 17 near-death experiences before the age of three. The pattern is the same. And what I'm finding with kids, they don't bond to parents. Uh-uh. The little ones don't bond. They bond to the other side. And they come back smarter, more creative. It's exciting work. So, my energy now, I'm as loose as a goose. I laugh a lot, and I don't care who I'm talking to. I tell it like it is. I remember I'm from Iowa.